Yeah. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, now we are in the third lecture of the day, uh, the first day of the uh, advanced school of cryptography. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Riyad Wabi. He is uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher at Algorand, working on designing and building secure hardware and software systems. Uh, next year, he will be joining the Car Carnegie Mellon University as an assistant professor. So for all those uh, interested students, uh, stay tuned. Uh, his research interests include uh, systems, computer security, and applied cryptography. And today, Riyadh is uh, going to survey the built proof systems la landscape and discuss current and potential uh, future applications of these systems in practice. So Riyadh, uh, this is all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you uh, to all the people who have put a lot of work into organizing, uh, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so before we start, I just, uh, as a sort of uh, practical matter, anytime you have a question, please interrupt. Uh, if you want to use the raise hand feature in Zoom, that's fine. If not, just unmute and start asking a question. Totally fine, too. I'll try to remember to stop and ask for questions along the way. Um, so uh, as Patrick said, and as the title kind of implies, what we're going to look at here are practical proof systems. So what this means is to me, practical, I mean, we always put quotes around practical because uh, you know this depends on uh, whose uh, who's point of view, but here we mean things that we can you know, sort of write some code and run and maybe deploy somewhere. Um, so in, we're, we're gonna kind of have two halves to this. In the first half, we're gonna kind of take a look at all the work and understand the relationships and uh, you know you know how these things are built at a high level, and then we're going to have a little break. And if, after that, we'll actually you know go and and uh, construct a proof system together in in some detail. So we'll see kind of the the related work, and then we'll also see a specific construction. Um, so and uh, as I said, please do ask questions. It'll be most fun if it's interactive. So. Um, Okay, so the, the jumping off point that is, is kind of this picture that we're seeing here, we have a verifier on the left uh, that has some computation that I'll call phi uh, and an input X. And then we have a prover who wants to convince the verifier that some output Y is equal to phi of X. So to do that, the prover is going to send along to the verifier a short proof pi that'll convince the verifier that Y is indeed phi of X. And sometimes we'll be talking about zero knowledge proofs. And in that case, the proof will convince the verifier that the prover knows some witness W, but pi won't reveal the witness. So phi of X and W equals, uh, equals Y and W is hidden from the verifier. Um, so the theoretical underpinnings for this uh, scenario go back to the mid 80s. And there's been you know, a lot of beautiful theoretical work on this. And in the last decade, maybe a little longer than a decade, there's been kind of an astonishing amount of work on re reducing the theory into practice. Um, I, I actually, I ran out of space here. That, that's what the ellipses uh, stand for. So if I missed uh, a work or five or 10, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, there are many of them. It's, it's a fun place to be working. Um, but one of the things that comes from having so many different, uh, so much different work in this area is how do we compare these things? How do we start to get a handle on, on you know, what's different and what's the same? And so what we can do is we can kind of think about some of the axes along which we can differentiate these systems. So one obvious one is cost. Uh, the computation for the prover and the verifier and the communication between them or the proof length if it's a non-interactive proof. Uh, we could also distinguish by cryptographic assumptions um, and by whether the system requires a trusted setup or some pre-processing of the statement, the, the phi, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see more about what all of these things mean. Um, we can ask about whether this is an interactive proof or a non-interactive proof. So in an interactive proof, the verifier and prover talk to one another, of course, and in the non-interactive version, the prover just writes down a proof and then anyone, uh, and then the verifier can read it. And sometimes we say it's a publicly verifiable proof if anyone can read it and check that it's correct. Um, I've mentioned zero knowledge. Sometimes we need zero knowledge, sometimes we don't. Um, and as we'll, we'll see in a little bit, we can also ask about a system's model of computation, uh, which is to say, what kind of programs, phi, can, is it sort of good to express in a particular proof system? So if there's really just one thing to take away from this whole time that we're gonna spend together today, it's that this is a huge trade-off space and none of the systems 
systems that we will see are dominant along all of these axes. So what that means is if you have a specific application in mind, you can choose a proof system for it, or you can design a proof system for it in all likelihood. Um, but it also means that maybe there's a little bit of analysis paralysis. So let's try to break out of that paralysis by further breaking down these proof systems. So when I say a proof system and a, a built proof system in particular, usually I'm going to mean something that takes in a computation and converts it into some form and then outputs, you know, the, the, the verifier and the prover. So really it's kind of like a pipeline. We go from uh, a computation phi to the computation that the verifier would run and the computation that the prover could run. And as we saw in the last slide, this is a, con a computation such that the prover convinces the verifier that y equals phi on x and w for a witness that the prover knows. So this, this kind of pipeline has two stages to it. Um, we can think about these as kind of a compiler, like a front end and a back end. In the front end, we convert the computation phi into some intermediate representation, uh, often but not always uh, sort of morally equivalent to an arithmetic circuit. And we're going to see in more detail what these representations look like later on. Um, and the, the, the idea here is to construct the representation such that satisfaction of the circuit is tantamount to correct execution of the program. So every correct execution has a corresponding uh, sort of assignment to all of the wires in the circuit. And any incorrect execution does not have an assignment that satisfies the circuit. OK, and then that's the front end. In the back end, we take some proving machinery, some kind of complexity theoretic and cryptographic objects, which we'll see, uh, to produce prover and verifier computations such that a valid proof establishes that the representation was satisfied and therefore that the program was executed correctly. So this is this is the basic, uh, the basic idea here. We have a front end, we convert some stuff. We have a back end that, that proves satisfaction. So now we're going to take a look at each of these pieces together. We're going to start with the back end, which is where we have these complexity theoretic and cryptographic objects. Now, I want to warn you before I turn, the next two slides will look a little dense. Um, the idea isn't to absorb everything. The idea is to sort of get a, an idea among, uh, get a, a, a notion of these relationships. And uh, as a second sort of uh, small pre-apology, it's not always clear whether we should consider any particular work a front end or a back end or something in between. So maybe I have a, a different opinion than you do about what counts as a front end so, uh, or a back end. So, so if I, if I Put something in the wrong place, uh, yeah, we can talk about it more, uh, more offline. Um, okay, so the what we the way, way I want to think about this first is what is the underlying complexity theoretic machinery or cryptographic machinery that these proof systems use? And when we build on different machinery, we get sort of different characteristics. So the first really practical proof systems uh, were built on the linear PCPs, uh, linear probabilistically checkable proofs of uh, Ishai, Kuselevitz, and Ostrovsky from IK07. Um, and essentially all of the systems of this type nowadays build on the quadratic arithmetic programs from uh, GGPR13. Uh, and the Pinocchio protocol, which was uh, Parno, Gentry, Howell, and Rykova in also in 2013. Um, and so there's been a lot of work refining and optimizing these. Uh, and um, a lot of this is hiding in the ellipses on the slide here. So um, there, there's a really, really a lot of work on this. But basically, the, the way to think about this is at this point, all the modern systems in this line build somehow indirectly on Pinocchio and almost always on this work from uh, Jens Grote at Eurocrypt 2016. OK, so that's one line. Another totally different line of work starts from interactive proofs or multi-prover interactive proofs. So at the bottom, all of these systems owe a debt to uh, Goldwasser, Kalai, and Rothblum's 2008 paper, um, Interactive Proofs for Muggles. Um, and so uh, these are. Uh, this is sort of a, a paper that shows, ah, you know, if we have an interactive proof system for specific kinds of, of computations, uh, that is anything in NP uh, and and say expressible as a layered arithmetic circuit, um, then we can actually we don't have to worry about the prover running forever. Uh, remember, in an interactive proof protocol, in in the in the sort of theoretical definition, uh, the prover is arbitrarily powerful and the verifier is polynomial time. But here, the idea is for certain statements and statements that we care about, the prover can actually be efficient too, can be polynomial time. So um, the, the you know, a, a really crucial step here was Cormode Mitzemacher Thaler 12, CMT 12, um, which showed not only can the prover be 
polynomial time, it can actually be very close to linear time. So these are actually quite efficient proof systems. Uh, and nowadays, we can get to perfectly linear time uh, proof systems. So these, these proof systems give us uh, something where the, the cost uh, for the prover is a multiplicative factor larger than just evaluating the program. And of course, that, that multiplicative factor is big, but it is not asymptotically bigger than, than the cost of running the program, which is kind of nice. Um, so th there's been a lot of work in this line that tries to turn these not only into interactive proofs, but into zero knowledge proofs, non-interactivity, et cetera. Uh, so th like ZKV SQL and, and Hyrax and Libra and, and later on Spartan, all of these are sort of refining this idea from uh, that underlies uh, GKR07. Another paradigm that we see is MPC in the head. So this is multi-party computation in the head, which comes from this IKOS uh, 08 paper. And the idea here is, Multi-party computation, if we think about it in a weird way, can actually be turned into uh, a zero-knowledge proof. The idea is essentially we could check the transcript of a multi-party computation and be, be sure, be, be convinced that the computation ran correctly. And if we're very careful about the way that we write down that transcript, then we can actually get a zero-knowledge proof system out of it. Um, so the first, uh, uh, the versions of this proof system that were practical were ZKBoo and ZKB++. Uh, and more recently, uh, in 2017, there was this, uh, this paper, Lajero, uh, that had some very nice uh, performance properties. Uh, and we'll see more on, on performance of these systems later. Um, another, yet another line of work we can think of as sort of generalizing and shrinking down sigma protocols. And you know, maybe the most popular or well known of these is bullet proofs, um, which gives very nice short proofs, like you know, logarithmically sized proofs in the in the size of the program. Um, and, and so this is a very nice, uh, a very nice uh, system as well. And then uh, we have another group: Aurora, Stark, Fractal, Virgo, Lihero Plus Plus, and many others build on interactive Oracle proofs, which is sort of you can think about this as a generalization of the probability checkable proof, um, and on this argument or computationally sound proof paradigm of Killian and Macaulay. And then finally, many recent works, including Sonic and Planck and Dark, uh, build on, uh, explicitly build on these polynomial commitment primitives uh, due to Kate, Zavarucha, and Goldberg. Uh, and now we should stop and say all of this is entirely too neat because we can't actually draw such bright lines between these systems. So all of these uh, works really interact and even the headings kind of interact uh, in a strong way. So for, for example, we can think about all of these polynomial commitment based schemes as building on IOPs too. Um, and or we can think about the arguments in you know, Stark and Fractal and Virgo as implicitly building something very close to a polynomial commitment scheme. So the line here is not very bright. Um, as another example, um, polynomial commitments are used to turn uh, you know, these interactive proofs like ZKV SQL and VRAM and Libra into something non-interactive. Uh, and as, uh, you know, as another example, Sonic uh, and bullet proofs both use an arithmetization that's due to Boodle et al from a 2016 paper. So again, a lot of sharing among these. So, and then maybe I think I had one more example. Ah, yes. So Lajero, we can think about that as a, P, as a, a PCIP, a, a, an interactive a polynomial, uh, sorry, uh, as a, um, um, an interactive PCP rather, uh, which is sort of a predecessor to this more general notion of, of IOP, which we'll see again in more detail later in the talk. So here, everything is a little bit mixed together, but I, the, the idea here is just to kind of get a general sense of where does all this intellectual debt go? Where, where do we, wh where, where, have, where has all of this come from in the theory? And so really it's sort of like, we have a, a few lines of work, linear PCPs, interactive proofs, uh, IOPs, Sigma protocols, MPC, and all of these sort of we taken together sort of give us the landscape today. So another thing that we talked about was cryptographic assumptions. Um, I mentioned we, we, we might we might want to we might build on on sort of very weak cryptographic assumptions or maybe our system builds on much stronger ones. And so we can also slice the systems apart this way. Um, so we can we can also ask whether a system needs trusted setup or not, which I, I mentioned earlier. So what, when we when we say trusted setup, what we mean is that there's some computation that's run before any proofs are generated. Uh, and that outputs what we call a structured reference string. Now the structured reference string is used to generate and verify the proofs. The reason that we say it's a trusted setup is if the reference string was generated dishonestly or incorrectly, then a cheating prover can prove a false statement. Or maybe in some cases, uh, a zero knowledge proof is no longer zero knowledge. It's usually this affects the soundness of the proof rather than the zero knowledge, but, but any, you know, in, in general, anything could happen if the setup is done dishonestly or incorrectly. Um, 
So you could see intuitively why we might want to avoid these trusted setup procedures, right? We have to find somebody to do it. Uh, and in practice, we've seen you know, many ways that people try to do this. So the, the cryptocurrency Zcash um, had a multi-party computation ceremony uh, to generate their, 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 their structured reference string. And then you know, people sort of got rid of their computers or, or, or did whatever they could to, to make everyone believe, oh, yes, I threw away all of the secret stuff that, that I need to forget in order for everyone to believe that this has been done honestly. Uh, so, so there's a lot of work that goes into trying to make these things more trustworthy. Um, but of course, we could even better would be we don't need a trusted setup at all. And so many of the systems that I'm listing here um, don't use one at all. And this has been a real focus recently uh, is, is getting rid of trust setup. Now, in contrast, some systems do use a trusted setup, but once the setup is done, the resulting structured reference string is universal. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on the program that's being proved. So that's a little bit better because now we only have to run it once and then we can sort of make any, a proof about anything that we want, say up to some size bound. Uh, and actually, we can even divide a little more finely because systems like Sonic and Planck and Marlin have something called an updatable structured reference string. What that means is, we can take the output from a prior execution of the setup procedure and we can re-randomize it. So I, let's say I find somebody's, somebody's output from the trusted setup procedure and I run a new procedure on it that bakes in some secret randomness that I know. And then uh, since I trust myself to have thrown away the secret randomness, now I can actually trust that the, that the output is correct, even if someone else runs that same update procedure. So you can kind of think about this as a slow motion multi-party computation that eventually produces a reference string that everyone trusts. And as long as someone along the way that you trust ran this update procedure, then you should trust the eventual output of this, of this, uh, of this procedure. And I should note here that uh, Mary Mahler's uh, dissertation actually shows that we could apply this trusted set, or sorry, this this uh, update procedure to systems like Libra, which uh, I don't think anyone has actually implemented that yet. Um, but I think there are some nice questions here about how can we can we extend this idea of an updatable setup procedure to to even more systems. So I think that's a nice a nice problem to think about. Sorry, can, can you say something more about this? So I, I thought that updatable, like could do updatable anytime the SRS are monomials. So, or is this, uh, is this the result you're referring to or what do you want to say? Yeah, so the, the, um, the uh, yeah, so basically the, the Libra, uh, um, system and, and some of the others in, in this category, they build on a sort of a slightly modified version of the Kate Zavarucha Goldberg uh, polynomial commitment. Uh, the modified version that they use is multivariate rather than univariate, but it still has the same idea inside of it of storing sort of essentially stor storing secrets in the exponent uh, that represent the monomials uh, of, of some of a, of a polynomial evaluated at some secret point, right? Um, and it, the, the criterion for whether they're updatable or not is precisely stated in Mary's uh, dissertation. I, I, I couldn't say it off the top of my head, but it, it turns out that if we look carefully at what's in Libra, um, that or something very close to it actually meets the criteria. So you could apply the same kind of updating procedure there. Uh, okay, great. Um, so, uh, oh, right. So uh, we, we talked about universal trusted setups. And then the last kind of category here are, uh, and this applies to most of the early practical systems in this area, uh, and most of the widely deployed ones today, like in Zcash, um, rely on a trusted setup procedure that actually depends on the computations. This is not universal. And that means if you want to run a new computation, you have to first run a new setup procedure. Um, now, Within these broad categories, we can further differentiate. And now we can look at crypto, specific cryptographic assumptions uh, that, that we have to make. So from weakest to strongest, we have some systems uh, are unconditional. They, 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 the ones based on purely uh, multi proof interactive proofs are, or interactive proofs or multi proof interactive proofs are information theoretic. But of course, they're interactive and the proofs you know, aren't, aren't short. Um, but it's possible to build a proof system with no cryptographic assumptions at all. And if we go to something like the MPC in the head or IOP or, or some of the polynomial commitment scheme based uh, systems, um, those rely on collision resistant hash functions. And if they're non-interactive, generally they, re they rely on the random Oracle model. 
Uh, some systems uh, like Bulletproofs and Hyrax and Spartan and Halo and others uh, rely on the Diffie-Hellman assumption and also for non-interactivity, random Oracle model. Um, it, Dark gives polynomial commitment schemes from the strong RSA assumption and, and, and uh, sort of related assumptions to that. And again, random Oracle model. Uh, and then some systems build on much stronger uh, assumptions or, or in stronger models. So systems that build on the polynomial commitment schemes uh, rely on some kind of knowledge of exponent assumption, which is a non-falsifiable assumption. So this is something that maybe is a little bit you know, a little bit uh, harder to, to swallow in some cases, um, or we can alternatively, we can just go to a stronger computational model. In the generic group model, we don't have to make any assumption, we just have to work in the model, and then we can prove that knowledge of exponent is, you know, is true. Um, uh, and finally, there are some that, that use a slightly weaker model, the algebraic group model, which is sort of a little a little weaker than generic groups, um, and that's sufficient to prove uh, security. And I believe even um, Jens Grote's uh, result from 2016 can be uh, proved secure in uh, the algebraic group model. So you see that we have this big range from nothing, no complexity assumptions at all, to you know basically the super heaviest weight crypto machinery that we have or close to it, right? And and you can kind of pick and based on what, what assumption you're willing to believe, maybe you get different performance properties. If you don't want to make any cryptographic assumptions, then you get none, you get something that's interactive and maybe long proofs. If you're willing to make very strong assumptions, then you get something with very, very short proofs that's not interactive and, and you know beautiful and very, very quick to verify. So this is a, a nice a nice handle that you can turn if you really need a trade-off uh, of that sort. Okay, so the, the next thing that we can uh, talk about, I guess, is how does the trusted setup amortize? And then we'll be done with this slide. So Pepper, Ginger, and Zoctar, which are listed in the second last kind of group at the bottom of the slide, um, need to run a batch of computations and then generate a proof for the whole batch at once. So that can be that can work in some cases, maybe some sort of cloud outsourcing case. Um, but uh, other systems like Pinocchio and its derivatives uh, have this idea that we first run this, this setup procedure that I mentioned earlier, and then we can reuse the same reference string essentially forever, you know, until we, uh, as long as we're running the same computation, we can keep using the same reference string. So that's a much nicer amortization model. And again, this is another knob that we can turn to, to kind of trade off among, uh, you know, do we want stronger assumptions or do we want weaker assumptions with something that's a little bit, uh, maybe in a deployment scenario, a little bit less uh, convenient. Okay, great. So uh, that takes care of kind of setup, cryptographic assumptions, trust, et cetera. Uh, any questions here, happy to answer them now. Otherwise we'll move on to another thing that we have to worry about, which is performance. Um, so now that we've looked at all these systems, let's think about like how much does it actually take? Let's look at concrete numbers. Um, so um, I, I wanna be clear here. We can't really say performance across the board is better for this system than that system, because sometimes the system is better for certain kinds of computations than others. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at one specific computation, which is um, proving knowledge of all of the leaves of a Merkle tree. So some systems maybe are a little bit better at this than others, but this is, you know, we're, we're putting in everything, everything on equal footing. So, you know, we'll do our best. So uh, here the, the X axis is the, the height of the tree, which is to say the, you know, the log base two of the number of leaves and the Y axis uh, here is proof size in kilobytes. So we're gonna look at proof size first. Um, so the gray triangles are Libsnark. This is, uh, you know, broadly representative of the Pinocchio style proofs, uh, growth 16, et cetera, um, has constant size proofs. They're very small. Um, and you know, a few hundred bytes, that's it. Um, it Hyrax, we see kind of in the middle, the, the green is you know, maybe 80 to 100 kilobytes and there's a cluster around there. You know, uh, Libra is a little smaller, uh, Lajero is a little bigger, but there is sort of a cluster there. Um, Bulletproofs is sort of in between uh, the, the, that tiny, tiny number and the cluster, maybe a kilobytes proof. And then something like ZKBoo or ZKB++ has you know, much larger proofs, like uh, in some cases up to megabyte sized proofs. Um, so I should say here, you know, we like to talk about these things in terms of asymptotics, but we, we kind of know that asymptotics aren't the whole story, right? Uh, and this graph to me actually puts this, this notion in sharp relief. So bulletproofs are logarithmic in, in, in proof size and, uh, Stark gives log squared size proofs and Stark is, so bulletproofs is the magenta right pointing triangles, uh, and Stark is the yellow plus signs. And so we have logarithmic versus log squared, and yet concretely we have orders of magnitude difference in these proof sizes. So always be careful to, <laughs> to think not only about the asymptotics, but about the concrete number of the, you know, that hidden constant in front, because those hidden constants uh, can be very, very large. So um, great. Okay, so that's proof size. 
Now, the next thing we can ask about is how long does it actually take to generate the proof? Uh, and this, I should say, is single-threaded proof size. Some of these systems can be thre it can be parallelized, and of course, we get some speed up from that. But uh, you know, we're we're thinking here about like, let's say the total amount of work that needs to be done. Um, so uh, I want to draw your attention to a couple that we saw on the last slide. So zkb plus plus on the last side we saw had really big proofs. But what we see here is it's really really fast to generate those big proofs. And in contrast, what we saw before was that bulletproof had tiny proofs. But now we can see that actually the prover is quite uh, quite slow. Uh, comparatively speaking, to generate those tiny, tiny proofs. So again, we see kind of a trade-off here. Um, well, can I say yes. something that I yes. think this is particularly interesting to me because um, in fact, bullet proofs are, are known for having a linear prover, no? Like it's always like a big topic that uh, bullet proofs have linear prover, but uh, snarks have like quasi-linear, but here it looks like much worse to have bullet proof. Um, yeah, and you know, I should I should note that uh, this this also depends strongly on the implementation. This is a very very good point. Uh, you know, the 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 quasi linearity of of the snark prover. Um, so uh, off the top of my head, I think it, concretely the the that sort of log factor in the proving time uh, for libsnark uh, really doesn't start to kick in until the proofs get huge. Until then, it's dominated by something that's essentially linear in the proof in the size of the statement. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, it ends up being roughly comparable uh, to to bulletproofs. Uh, there's some uh, you know difference in you know a concrete number of. Uh, cryptographic operations per gate or per constraint, um, but yeah, and and of course there there's little differences in the in the implementations. Maybe we can make things faster with you know special operations. There's a really really nice implementation of bulletproofs that I think is faster yeah. than the one I'm showing here. But yeah, yeah but absolutely. Like, this, for me, this is very shocking because another point is that um, like bulletproofs in principle you don't need pairings, right? So like you could implement them in pairing free groups, which in principle are more efficient. So uh, I'm I'm very surprised. Great graphic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's it's true. I, I I should you know I, I I should emphasize again. This is this does uh, to some extent come down to the implementation, and it may be that you know there's a little bit of apples and oranges here. And uh, yeah, I think that the Dalek implementation of of bulletproofs, which is based on Curve 5519, is very 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 fast, um, and probably is a little bit faster than what I'm showing here. But yeah, at, at the high level point here is as you say. The, the asymptotics are not not the final story. The libsnark is actually you know pretty impressive in its speed. Um, so uh, so that's prov prover time. And so then the last desideratum we can look at is verifier time. Uh, so again, single threaded performance. Um, so libsnark we had short proofs, and we can see it has super duper fast verification, constant uh, constant size. Sorry, constant nearly constant time verification. It's not quite constant because the verifier has to actually process the claimed inputs and outputs, um, but uh, but nearly constant time uh, verification. Um, and then we have some, uh, you know, some some systems like again bulletproofs. There's no pre-processing step. There's no trusted setup. But now the verifier has to essentially work the linear in the size of the program that's being run, right? So we get zero knowledge, but we don't actually get work savings uh, in the sense that the verifier has to do as much work to check the proof as it would have had to do to run the program in the first place. Um, and then we, again, in the middle, we have you know a, a few systems that are all sort of clustered together um, that give us. You know something that looks like uh, sublinear verification in the size of the program being proved. Um, so, but now we have to do a little bit of a sanity check because what I said earlier was that you know if we're pre-processing, uh, you know, all, of all of these systems, the only one that's actually pre-processing the program uh, that that we're proving is is libsnark. Uh, the rest of these don't take trusted setup and they don't require a pre-processing step. So the question is, how can they possibly get sublinear verification? Because What's going on here, of course, is that the, the verifier has to know what is being proven to it. Otherwise, the prover could just say, I'm, I'm proving to you that one plus one is two. And the verifier says, thank you very much, yes. Um, right. So, so somehow the verifier has to read in at least the statement that, that, that's being proved. So, or, or, so, so then how is it possible that we can get sublinear verification in the size of that statement? Well, any ideas? Okay, the answer to this is um, a lot of these systems can take advantage of underlying structure in the computation. So 
if a computation can be expressed as sort of repeated applications of some function or as many sort of identical copies of some subprogram, then the verifier really only has to read in, say, the one function that's repeatedly applied or the subprogram that's being executed many times in parallel. So this is one way that we see a lot of systems get sublinear verification, even if they don't uh, require any kind of preprocessing. So this is another thing to keep in mind. If your statement is, you know, has some structure to it, then often you can find or design a proof system that will take advantage of that structure. Okay, so this is sort of the, 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 the whirlwind overview of the back ends. Um, let's move on to the front ends. So remember the goal for the front end was essentially a compiler. It's essentially converting a computation written in some programming language to the representation that we care about, which is arithmetic circuits or maybe, or some kind of arithmetic constraint. Again, I, I promise we will see in detail uh, the kinds of constraints that we'll be thinking about a little later. So the other, the, the way that we can think about this, well, one way we can think about this, as I said earlier, is, well, what kinds of programs does a particular front end work well for? Um, and we can also think about it in terms of the representation that we're targeting, either circuits or, or constraints or something like this. So uh, let's think about that first one, that model of computation question. So there are kind of two high level approaches here. The first one, roughly speaking, is to translate the computation into some kind of finite state machine. Um, so you can think about that as, uh, for example, like a program that executes on a CPU. The CPU is a finite state machine and you know, we're executing on the finite state machine. So, so we could imagine saying, we're gonna write down the, you know, the transition function of a CPU and then we're just going to prove that you know, after K steps of the, of the CPU, the program you know, had some behavior. Um, so this is what we saw in um, BCGTV13 and, and BCTV14A and some more recent, um, uh, more recent systems. Um, and a lot of these use this, this um, tiny RAM uh, processor architecture, which is sort of a very nice little risk uh, uh, processor architecture. So the idea is we encode the fetch to code execute loop of the tiny RAM processor in the proof system. And then the program whose execution we're actually proving correct is essentially passed in as input to the program, right? As input to the proof. So I give you a program, you run the program, you tell me that you prove to me that it's correct. And this is you know, very natural. This is very much like how we run a program on a CPU. Uh, and actually there's one work here, BCTV 14B, um, that takes this uh, step, this uh, another step further. This, uh, this uh, work is called uh, um, Scalable Zero Knowledge via cycles of elliptic curves. I believe it appeared at crypto 2014. Um, the idea here is we can, if we, since we're applying the same transition function over and over again, we can use recursive proof composition to make things even more scalable in a particular sense. Um, so the sense in which it's more scalable is the prover only has to work with a, with a small uh, sort of statement, namely one execution of the transition function. Um, but what it has to do is it has to prove not only this step of the transition function was done correctly, but also some previous proof attests to the correctness of all the prior steps of the transition function. So in each of these recursive applications of the proof system, what we prove is I know a proof for everything up until this step and this step was correct, right? So we can inch along taking one step at a time, generating a new proof. And then finally, finally at the end, the verifier checks one proof. Now there's been a lot of recent work on this that, that goes beyond uh, what, what bcv 14 b does. It tries to make it uh, more efficient, et cetera. There's Halo, Halo Infinite, um, uh, there's, um, uh, recursive proof composition from accumulation schemes. Um, all of these papers are, you know, so are, are pushing, pushing along this idea of recursively composing proofs in order to make the prover more scalable by requiring it only to prove small statements at a time. So it sort of bites off one chunk of the program at a time. Unfortunately, the downside of this really cool approach, both the pr proof composition version and the non-composition version is that proving the execution of the CPU transition function is usually significantly more expensive than doing something more direct, like proving the computation itself was done correctly rather than sort of going indirectly via, uh, um, via this uh, you know, finite state machine transformation. And, and so this is the other approach that we, want, that we might wanna take 
is one where we can hope to squeeze out more efficiency by making a custom circuit that only applies to a particular program. So if we think about the first one as a CPU, then maybe this one is like an FPGA, like a, which is sort of a programmable piece of hardware. Um, but here, of course, the circuit isn't hardware, it's an arithmetic circuit. Um, so what we do here is we translate a program line by line into constraints that encode precisely that line of the program. Um, and so basically every system other than the ones that I mentioned previously work in this model where the, the statement is sort of a custom statement for each program. Uh, so there's been a lot of work on compilers from C, from specific languages. Um, Socrates is a, 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 a proof Ba uh, proof systems language that's getting a lot of traction now. And this is uh, sort of an open source project. Um, so there are these are compilers from these high level languages to specific circuits just for one program. Um, so I should say here though that not all is uh, as beautiful as they've made it out to be in this uh, compiling to specific programs uh, 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 universe because what I've written here on the slide is hiding something, just a little something. Uh, and what I'm hiding here, uh, oh, sorry, I, I should say first, uh, the GKR-based systems, uh, some, some of them need a low depth circuit. So this is a sort of a, maybe a third uh, model of computation. We're gonna ignore that uh, essentially for the rest of the talk, but I'm happy to talk about that offline. Um, but what I'm hiding here is basically there's no operation greater than or equal to, right? I had this, this notion, if I is greater than or equal to five, then we do something else, we do something else. Okay. The problem is how do we express greater than or equal to in an arithmetic circuit? And the answer I've kind of put up on the slide here is very clunky. What we have to do is essentially build a Boolean circuit inside the arithmetic circuit. We emulate a Boolean circuit that computes greater than or equal to and how do we do that? Well, we take every field element in our in our circuit that we need to, to operate on, and we split it up into its, into its constituent bits. And then we need constraints to make sure that each of those bits is indeed zero or one and not some other value in the field. And then finally, once we've done that, now we can essentially implement the Boolean circuit that, that does what we want. So this is expensive. Uh, so usually this is gonna cost something like, you know, log of the size of the field that we're working in. Um, uh, so what this means is we get this pretty big blow up. Uh, normally for these proof systems, we're working in, in you know, uh, finite fields that are, you know, 60 bits, 100 bits, 200 bits, um, which means that, you know, a greater than or equal to operation, which on a CPU was one cycle, is now hundreds of constraints uh, inside of a proof. So what this kind of tells us is our intuition for what's fast and what's slow on a CPU doesn't really apply so well in the proof systems case. So this is another sort of stumbling block that we have to be a little careful about. And I should say, finally, that there's no free lunch. TinyRAM doesn't get, to, doesn't get this for free either. What happens is the, all that logic of splitting up bits and implementing Boolean circuits, et cetera, that's just baked into the transition function of the CPU. So really, everyone has to pay that. But it is a bit of a stumbling block. OK. So that was sort of how things translate. Now we can ask, what can they translate? How, what can front ends handle? And there is a wide range here. So some front ends are super duper special purpose. They handle uh, you know, very specific computations and they make them super efficient, like uh, Thaler 13, which is in the top left corner of the slide here. Um, that handles, that has like a super fast protocol for matrix multiplication. Um, and it's super great, but it's it's a it's special purpose thing. Um, as we move to the right, we get computations that I that are let's say pure. What does that mean? It means no inner, no input output, no RAM access, etc. Stateful programs, ones that have RAM access, uh, which we emulate via sort of memory checking literature kind of tricks. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to go into them. I'm happy to talk about them offline. Um, and then if we move all the way to the right, we get program we get uh, compilers that handle. Uh, roughly speaking, general purpose control flow. It's not quite true that they're general purpose because of course the programs have to be bounded in size because the proof has to be you know, over a statement that's bounded in size. So, so uh, but, but these essentially handle familiar program constructs, RAM, data dependent looping, uh, et cetera. One way to do that as we've already seen is to emulate a CPU Another way to do that, and this is what um, Buffet does, uh, and, and VRAM takes a, uh, an approach that's sort of a combination of emulating the CPU and, and what Buffet does. But what, what Buffet does is, is essentially turns the program, like given a program, it turns it into a custom state machine just for that program. 
And now what that means is we get sort of all the advantages of a CPU with some, and we get rid of some of the disadvantages. We don't have to pay the cost of generality of a CPU. Instead, we have sort of a custom state machine that only applies to one particular program. So we can ask, well, how much does that actually save? Well, let's look at some benchmarks and find out. So here I, I'm showing, um, I'm fixing the backend as libsnark. So here, everything is on the same footing for backend. Uh, and now we're just going to compare the front ends. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the cost for the CPU-based approach, which is BCTV14, um, the FPGA-like approach, which is uh, which I'm showing as pantry here, uh, and then the, the hybrid approach, which is buffet. Uh, and so uh, a couple things to note before we start, um, there have been some more recent works since buffet and, and, and pantry and BCTV14. Uh, XJSNARC improves on, on some aspects of uh, buffet's performance by about 3x. Um, VRAM uh, is somewhat faster uh, for all programs, but much faster for matrix multiplication than Buffet is. So for specific pr computations or for different proof systems, we could do a little bit better, but this is still a, a rough idea of how things work. Um, so basically we're gonna look at three computations here. We have matrix multiplication, we have merge sort, and we have uh, string search. And what we see is that for straight line programs that are purely arithmetic, like matrix multiplication, Pantry and Buffet, basically the same uh, performance, uh, but the CPU-based approach, which has all of this generality that's unnecessary for something like matrix multiplication, is paying a lot. It's paying, you know, three quarters of magnitude. If we go to something more complex like merge sort, now we have data-dependent looping, and the CPU really helps compared to the sort of custom software, the custom hardware approach, like in in, uh, in Pantry. But Buffet is able to do a little bit better because it doesn't have to pay for generality. Uh, and we say, see something e even more extreme along those lines when we go to something like string search, which has sort of even more of this uh, data-dependent looping and, and the, the, this kind of property. So, so what we see is that we actually can, with some sort of program transformations, we can make these the costs a lot better. But this graph is sweeping something very important under the rug. We can add one more column, one more bar to each of these columns native execution. And when we do that, what we see is that we were talking about uh, optimizations that were maybe one to two orders of magnitude, but the overhead of the whole proof system is something like six to eight orders of magnitude, which is obviously pretty heavy. And I should be clear, I'm not just picking on, on libsnark here. This isn't the backend's fault. And if we picked a better backend, no, 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 no. We remember we saw this proof, uh, this prover uh, performance graph earlier. What we see is that all of these uh, systems are clustered in sort of a one or two or maybe three order of magnitude span. So compared to that six order of magnitude overhead, you know, we, we can make a little bit of improvement by choosing a different proof system. But for the most part, no, this six orders of magnitude is, is something that we're kind of stuck with in the literature right now. So this is sort of an important uh, open question. How do we make these proof systems uh, more performant? But there's a different way of slicing this that in some sense is even more depressing. Um, and, and this is um, reachable problem sizes. So the graphs that I showed a couple slides ago, we were comparing three different systems, but actually the performance for the two systems, not Buffet, but the other two, Pantry and BCTV, were actually extrapolated uh, performance graphs. If we, if we look at what each of these could handle on say the same amount of RAM, let's say on a normal laptop with uh, you know 16 gigs of RAM or something like this, now what we see is that actually things are pretty depressing, right? We can handle uh, you know merge sort of 500 elements in the best case, but in the worst case only eight elements. I mean this is like this is not uh, you know a serious program size. So this seems like a much more depressing reality, right? We we can't really handle big programs right now in proof systems, and so well we can ask how do we make how do we get how do we get better at this? Um, we could pick applications where small um, small programs are okay. That's one thing that we've we've seen a lot in, say, the cryptocurrency space. But maybe another is, and this is what um, uh, some folks, uh, Wu et al. Uh, at, at Usenix Security 18 said, well, what we could do is maybe instead of running it on one machine, we run it on many machines. Okay, that sounds uh, straightforward, but it's much easier said than done. Um, there's a lot of you know, really nice problems to solve in this. Um, but the, the most immediate technical challenge that, that uh, DIZIC, which is this uh, Wu et al. paper from using Security 18, um, 
the technical challenge that they really had to overcome was how do we do these huge FFTs um, distributed across many machines? And it turns out that Zay looked at a similar problem in 2011 in the context of terabit integer multiplications. Um, and he showed that you can actually express uh, an enormous FFT, uh, let's say of size N, as a map reduce problem uh, where uh, there's batches of uh, square root N problems uh, of size square root N each. So now we can distribute to many nodes um, and and sort of parallelize the work and and you know reduce this bottle break break this bottleneck. But of course, with map reduce, we should always be worried that map reduce sweeps uh, the shuffle stage in the middle under the rug, right? It's, it's really map shuffle reduce, and that shuffle stage is communication intensive. And this is uh, sort of a bottleneck in in this system um, is the communication between the mappers and the reducers. So this is another problem that we we can think about. Uh, this is a nice problem to, to to try and solve. How do we distribute these computations in a way that doesn't introduce some kind of communication bottleneck? But Dizik in spite of this bottleneck, did very impressive stuff. So here's the, the evaluation results. Um, so the problem sizes that we can reach go from say a million constraints on a single node of their cluster to a few billion constraints when they use 200. And so what that means is that they can run computations that are about a hundred times bigger at least than what I could run on you know, my little laptop. Uh, and really this distributed regime, maybe it's not so hard to implement, right? Because I can just go to AWS and I can spend $10 and now I've got, you know, 100 machines for a few hours, right? So this really is a pretty, pretty realistic uh, scenario where I can just use a couple hundred workers. Uh, and the other question that we can ask is, well, how well does it scale? Um, so here we can see um, that each, each of the colored lines represents a cluster of a different size, going from you know, very small to very big uh, from left to right. Um, and so as we go from like four to 64 workers, the proving time goes from an hour to just a few minutes. So this is pretty close to linear in the number of workers. So I really can push down that proving time. Not only can I support bigger proofs, but I can also make the proving time pretty quick by adding more parallelism and adding, you know, sort of more workers to the cluster. Okay, so this takes us through back ends and front ends. Uh, and we have some idea about what the costs are and the reachable problem sizes. So now I want to look at just two quick end to end applications. Uh, and, and see what we can learn from them. Uh, maybe two clusters of end-to-end -end applications, let's say. So the first one uh, that I wanna mention, because of course this is the main application in, in practice of, of proof systems today, um, is, is cryptocurrencies. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Zcash is super well known uh, and this, it comes from an academic paper called Zero Cash in 2014. Uh, and the idea here is that, you know, I can spend money without revealing who I am by proving that I've spent money correctly in zero knowledge. Um, that's sweeping a lot under the rug, but um, that's essentially what's going on. Um, then there's efforts to enable private transactions that, that hide just the amount spent, but not who spent. Um, so that's uh, uh, confidential transactions, which I believe was proposed by Greg Maxwell. Um, and then there's this uh, project from uh, Order One Labs called Coda, uh, which builds rec uses recursive proof composition to shrink the amount of work that I have to do in order to catch up with the, the, the blockchain. So now instead of checking you know, many, many, many blocks, um, I can check just one proof that convinces me that the whole history of the chain is correct. Um, and that's super cool, right? That's, that's really exciting. If we can see practical applications of these recursive proof systems, that would be really amazing. And I'm really, really looking forward to this. Um, and then I, I want to mention, this is not a general purpose proof system, but it is uh, sort of uh, another, another way that we can go. Um, uh, th there's some work that, that, that um, I did with uh, Dan Bonet and Chris Jeffries and Joseph Poon on um, enabling privacy for airdrops. So the idea here is, you know, I want to start up a cryptocurrency, so I give away a bunch of money to people in order to get them interested in the, in the, in the currency. Um, and this uh, one uh, 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 this one um, uh, currency called Handshake said, "Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to hand, we're going to airdrop to GitHub developers." But when they, you know, shopped this idea around, what they found was people didn't want their, you know, airdrops uh, to be linked to their GitHub identities because these are sort of two separate worlds. Maybe I work and I use GitHub for work, uh, and I don't want, uh, you know, that identity to be mixed in with my, you know, private financial dealings. Um, so the idea here was we can airdrop to, un, you know, anonymously to RSA keys. Um, and so this is a really, really special purpose thing, and we didn't use general purpose proofs for it. And if we had, it would have been, you know, way too expensive. So this uh, really the message here is. If you can get away with a special purpose proof system, you should absolutely try to, because you know then you don't pay the cost of generality. Um, so 
you know, maybe that's not a surprising thing, but it's always worth keeping in mind that we don't have to immediately go to, you know, an amazing, fully general, beautiful proof system. Sometimes all you need is a Sigma protocol. And those are good times. Okay. So let's think about one more cryptocurrency related uh, application that's becoming really, really, really popular. Uh, and this is called a roll up. So this comes from uh, Barry White Hat um, in 2018. Um, and now I, I think these are kind of all over the place. So the setting here is basically this. I wanna build a bank using a smart contract. So the way that that'll work is if I wanna, if let's say Alice wants to send Bob money, she sends a sign message to the contract. And then Bob and Carol, they can also uh, do the same thing. They can do transactions on the contract. But the problem with this picture is that when, it, when we say the smart contract does computation, what's really going on is that somewhere the cryptocurrency miners or whoever has to like check all of those, uh, you know, all of those uh, transactions, which means that there are like hundreds of, of people who are validating each signature or maybe thousands of people who are validating each signature. And that means that there's a lot of overhead. So the roll-up idea is we're going to add a third party called an aggregator. And then when somebody wants to transact, they send a sign message to the aggregator. And then every once in a while, the aggregator creates a batch of transactions and generates a zero knowledge proof that it knows all the valid signatures corresponding to those transactions. And then it just sends the proof to the smart contract and all the contract has to do is check the proof. So now instead of checking you know, 10,000 signatures, you can, each of the, the workers who, who are securing the chain just have to check one proof and that gives them confidence in all of these transactions all at once. So I should point out, there are some downsides to this too. We have to rely on the aggregator for liveness. So maybe we need some sort of incentive mechanism to make sure that works. There's all sorts of interesting design problems here, but fundamentally what's going on is we're able to essentially outsource checking in the, instead of having the, the validators of the chain, say the miners or whoever doing all these signature checking, that's outsourced to the aggregator who just proves that, that he did all the checking correctly. So we can think about this as in a sense, really like a verifiable computation, it, exactly like we saw at the beginning, outsourcing from one person to, a, to the cloud and then getting back just a proof that it was done correctly. Okay, so that's, that's a, sort of a cryptocurrency related uh, uh, application that's uh, maybe at this point somewhat familiar. Um, let's look at something that's totally, totally, totally different, just completely different. And that is building trustworthy hardware. Okay, this might seem weird, but let's say that we want to design a custom chip that does packet processing for us. And because you know we know how to design a chip, let's say, but we don't have, you know, we don't own a factory to build chips. So we're gonna outsource the production of the chip to somebody else, to a, to a third party manufacturer or a fab. But the problem is, and this is a well-studied problem in the literature, the fab might actually be malicious. And maybe what the fab does is it inserts a backdoor into the chip that we've produced. And what maybe, maybe that, that backdoor now in, allows, you know, with this magic sequence of packets, some attacker can get access to machines behind my firewall that I tried to build. So this isn't good. Uh, and it's also not paranoia. Um, there's a lot of evidence that backdoor hardware is already in the wild. Um, there's been, you know, many high profile cases, including Bloomberg recently reporting on, you know, these, these supposed uh, hacks of, of, of hardware pr production uh, companies, et cetera. So this, this is something that, that people are taking seriously, including the US Department of Defense, who has this, uh, this program called the Trusted Foundry Initiative, where they use uh, sort of, you know, onshore fabs and chains of custody to make sure that nobody, you know, untrusted gets to touch the chips. Um, and maybe that seems like a lot of trouble, but the reason they go to all that trouble is because it's essentially the only way to get strong guarantees of correctness. There's been a lot of work on showing how a malicious chip manufacturer can build backdoors into chips that evade detection. And the upshot from all of this work is that the attackers are winning. There's just, there's no good defense against this um, uh, for in the general case. But on the other hand, trusting the fab, that doesn't always solve our problem either because there are only a few countries in the world that actually have cutting edge fabs on shore. And if I wanna build a new cutting edge fab to build my chips, then I have to spend billions of dollars and years of development. Or maybe I would say, well, I don't need the latest fab, I can use an older fab. But if that's true, then now I have to pay huge penalties because of the physics of transistor scaling. So if I use uh, you know, a 20 year old fab, then I'm gonna pay eight orders of magnitude in performance compared to something state of the art. So this is where, this is where now maybe proofs can, can, can come in. The idea here is we're going to outsource in the hardware context. We're gonna take computations 
outsource them to untrusted chips, and then only check that the result was, that, that the untrusted chip computed was correct. And this is, we, we call this verifiable ASICs. So the model is like this. Um, in, instead of designing one chip that's going to execute our computation, like our firewall or whatever, we're going to design two separate chips. One is a prover and one is a verifier. We're going to outsource the prover to an untrusted but cutting edge fab, the fastest fab we can find. And the verifier, we're going to outsource to probably a slower fab, but one that we can trust. Afterwards, we're going to integrate the two chips into a single device, and that's what's delivered to the end user, the operator. Now, to execute the computation, the operator gives an input to the verifier who passes it along to the prover, and then the prover sends back an answer plus a proof that the answer was computed correctly. And now, once the verifier chip is satisfied that the, com that the computation was correct, it can re release that output to the user. So, okay, this is a good story on paper, but is it practical? Well, maybe. So, this is an evaluation based on simulations of chips that do verified elliptic curve point multiplication. Um, so here, the prover chip is in a modern cutting edge technology, uh, and the verifier chip is in kind of 20 year old technology. And we're looking at results for two systems versus the native baseline. So Zebra, which introduced the verifiable ASICs model, and Giraffe kind of refined the approach and improved its scalability. And what we're measuring here is how much energy does it cost to execute the computation just using the trusted chip, that's the native, versus outsourcing the computation to the untrusted chip and checking the proof, that's Zebra and Giraffe. So here, x-axis is the amount of parallelism in the computation. Remember earlier I said we could take advantage of parallel structure in the computation. Here, this is exactly what we're doing. Um, and what we see is that after about 30 of these repeated computations, outsourcing is actually lower in cost, according to these simulations, the native execution. So this is another example of a regime where even given the limitations today, we can still hope to use these proof systems in a way that gives us an advantage over sort of uh, native execution. But on the other hand, maybe we should regard this as a negative uh, result because, oh, look, we had to kind of go to great lengths. We had to go to a weird setting and, you know, a huge difference between the verifier and the prover. And, you know, the, the win is maybe three or four X. So, uh, you know, I, I leave this to you. Uh, is this is this a, a positive or a negative? I'm not sure. Um, but I'd say right now, this is the sort of uh, place where we find applications for proof systems, where we can sort of find the right mix of outsourcing to you know outsourcing a computation to somebody whose whose cycles are very cheap or saving work for many verifiers in parallel which is what we saw in the uh, in the rollups case okay so we've gone through a couple applications we've seen back ends we've seen front ends um so just as a recap of this sort of first half of the 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 talk um what we've seen is basically there's a huge design space here. There are many different cryptographic assumptions, many different uh, underlying technologies, um, and one size doesn't fit all. Um, right now, costs are very high, but there are some applications that are cool and near near future, if not current, where maybe we can find justification for spending, uh, you know, spending on all of that cost. And I'd say this is one another place where there's a lot of room for innovation. Applications that have the right mix of cost and uh, you know, sort of setting where this actually makes sense, where we can actually apply today's proof systems. Okay, so this is sort of the end of the first half. Um, I think as long as everyone's okay, we can take a five minute break, maybe get a drink of water, and then we'll come back and we'll go into some low level details on how we would actually construct a particular proof system. Sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. Great. And if there are any questions at this point, happy to take them before we go to break. Or, uh, you know, if you think of some during break, we'll, we'll, we can take some more when we come back. Okay. Okay. So think about questions for the break. Uh, and we'll be back in five minutes. Uh, so I have 0230 right now. So we'll be back at 0730. Okay. Okay. Riyad, before, before, go ahead, Riyad, all yours. Oh, great. Okay. So uh, welcome back. Uh, in this part, like I said, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to construct a SNARG. So I'll define that as a succinct non-interactive argument. Uh, so uh, sometimes we see SNARK. I'm going to write this here. Sometimes we see SNARK, which is a succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. So we're, we're not going to worry about the knowledge part. Um, we're just going to construct a succinct non-interactive argument. Um, so uh, this is sort of a, a, a stepping stone on the way. Um, but I think this, this gives us enough material. Um, and please do, uh, anytime there's questions, please do feel free to interrupt. Uh, and um, yeah, and I think we'll 
um, we should be able to, you know, have some fun. Uh, good. Okay. So to start, um, we're going to, we're basically, this is what we're going to try and cover. We're going to look at arithmetic circuits and constraints. I said earlier that we were going to look at these in somewhat more detail. Um, so now we will. Uh, then I'll define some, I'll define the polynomial commitment primitive. We won't construct one. We'll just assume that we have one. Uh, and then we'll go from polynomial uh, commitments to SNARGs via interactive Oracle proofs. Uh, then we'll build some sort of mini proof systems for some polynomial statements. Uh, and we'll put those together into what, what I'll call Marlin Light, which is sort of a, a light version of uh, a paper called Marlin that's uh, Kiesa et al. Uh, uh, from 2020. Uh, and then at the end, we'll sort of we'll, we'll put it all together and we'll see what's missing to get all the way to uh, a snark. OK. Um, great. So let's uh, let's jump on in. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, oops, I think I might have the I might have the ordering slightly wrong. Uh, okay. Well, that's okay. Uh, you know what? We'll start with polynomial commitments, and then we'll go we'll go to arithmetic circuits because that's the order my notes are. Uh, apologies for misleading you. Okay, great. So a polynomial commitment um, is we have we have a, a set of uh, algorithms. We have uh, four algorithms: set up, commit open and check. Uh, and the idea here is setup is going to output some public parameters. Uh, and, and let's just assume that somehow the, the security parameter is just fixed for, for this scheme. So we're going to ignore the security parameter here. Um, a commitment, uh, so, and sorry, D, this, this argument to setup is the degree bound, which is to say the maximum degree uh, that these public parameters can be of a polynomial that these public parameters can be used to commit to using the commitment or uh, the commitment uh, algorithm. So commit takes in the public parameters uh, and it takes in a polynomial F and it outputs a commitment to F. Okay. Then using the commitment to the commitment and uh, well, actually, no, just using the polynomial and some point X pi produces a proof um, that that you know f of x is some value y and finally check lets us check that the proof pi indeed attests to the claim that f of x equals y so pi convinces the verifier that y equals f of x uh, and that you know f is committed to by C. OK, so this is the syntax. Um, and uh, we have sort of three requirements uh, in terms of uh, you know, useful polynomial commitment schemes. We have efficiency. Um, and for today, we'll assume that the efficiency implies that, um, that the size of the commitment is constant. Uh, and the size of the proof is, uh, let's say, uh, log the log of the degree. Okay, so these are quite compact. The proof is at most logarithmic in the degree, and the commitment is constant sized. And maybe we can even do better than that, but that's that's what we'll say for efficiency. Um, we also want completeness, which is sort of the standard definition. Um, uh, if you know, y indeed equals f of x, then an honest prover can, can convince a verifier that y equals f of x. Um, and we want soundness, which means if y is not equal to f of x, then no dishonest prover can convince a verifier that, that it does. So you can't, it's infeasible to produce a proof um, for an incorrect statement, y equals f of x. So these are the three properties that we need. Okay, so we're going to use polynomial commitments later on as a building block. Okay, so the next thing that we need, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, is arithmetic circuits and constraints because we're, we're again we're going to be using these uh, in a bit. Um, okay, so an arithmetic circuit um, is essentially a generalized Boolean circuit, right? So the gates in a circuit are either multiplication or addition over some finite field f, uh, and the wires take values uh, from the field. And we say that an arithmetic circuit C is satisfied um, if all wires are labeled correctly, which is to say, um, 
you know, for any multiplication gate, it must be the case that y is equal to x1, uh, you know, times x2 in f. Uh, let's call that y1. Uh, and for any addition gate, we, it must be the case that y2 is equal to x1 plus x2 in f. Okay, so far this is pretty familiar. And of course, a Boolean circuit is merely a restriction on this, where we say that f is f2, uh, you know, the, 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 the field of cardinality 2, uh, which means that multiplication becomes, uh, you know, a logical and, and addition becomes logical xor. Okay, so let's look at an example um, of an arithmetic circuit. Um, so this is a, an arithmetic circuit where we have, uh, you know, a few gates, uh, and we can think about this as expressing constraints on the wires in the circuit, right? So um, this is, we can think about this as constraints of the following form. So we, the, this circuit constrains W1 to equal X1 plus X2, and it constrains W2 to equal W1 times X3, and it, can, and it constrains W3 to be seven times X4, uh, and it constrains Y1 to be W2 times W3. Okay, so these are four arithmetic constraints. But there's something slightly unfortunate here, and that is these constraints kind of have different formats to them. Some of them are addition, some of them are multiplication, some of them are multiplication by constants. It would be nice if we could rewrite all of these using one kind of constraint, sort of one, we think about it as like a, you know, a universal constraint constraint for, for our, to take a place of sort of these, these different types of constraints. Um, and so that's the idea behind a rank one constraint. Sometimes you'll see R1CS, which we'll, we'll define in a moment, but each rank one constraint is an R1C, the S stands for system. So if we define some vector Z to be sort of the concatenation of three vectors, X, Y, W, and the, the constant one, and we'll say that this is a vector of length N, um, then we have, let's, we're going to have three other vectors, A, B, C, also of length n, we have a rank one constraint is given by the inner product of A and Z times inner product of B and Z equals inner product of C and Z. Okay, and this, this is sort of, this is dot product or inner product. Okay, so you can think about this as essentially constraint on linear combinations of all of the wires in Z, right? So this is constraints on linear combinations of Z. And we can do one multiplication per constraint, right? Because each of these is, we sort of do a linear combination of Z times a linear combination equals a third linear combination. Okay, so now given this, now we can write down, um, we can go back to our original circuit and now we can write down rank one constraints, okay? So uh, as step one, we'll define the, the, the vector Z to be, you know, in this case, all the X's concatenated with Y, the single Y concatenated with the, the intermediate values W and then the, the value one, okay? And now what we can do is we'll write down uh, constraints on the outputs of each multiplication gate in the circuit. Okay, so constraint number one is um, W2 equals X1 plus X2 times X3. And constraint two is, you can just, we're sort of just reading these off. Um, W3 is equal to seven times X4. And constraint three uh, is, um, you know, y1 equals w2 times w3. Okay, so here are our constraints. Um, and then finally, we actually have to turn these into, remember we, the, the rank one constraint system is, is defined in terms of sort of inner products. So what we do is we turn these into uh, sort of vectors. Okay, so for each of these constraints, we're gonna read out the a, b, and c vectors. Um, so, uh, in the case of uh, you know the, the constraint one, uh, we constraint one was w two equals x one plus x two times x three. Okay, so 
the output is is w2 which means you know we have a bunch of zeros right so this is you know this inner product with z gives us w2 uh, and then you know x1 plus x2 Uh, and then x3. Okay, so those are that's a1, b1, and c1 are these uh, nice simple uh, vectors which we can just we can get by just sort of reading out uh, from the definition of z. And we could do likewise for uh, you know for the other two for a a2, b2, c2, and a3, b3, c3. But um, you know we we will leave that uh, as an exercise. Okay, so then once we've done that and um, now we have a set of rank one constraints and we wanna turn this into a rank one constraint system. So uh, an R1CS or rank one constraint system is given by three M by N matrices where each one is defined as essentially, uh, you know, sort of a column of, or sort of a row wise combination of the individual vectors. So this is, you know, A1, A2 up to A sub M, uh, and likewise, capital B, the matrix is given by, you know, these row vectors, B1, B2, up to B sub M, and C, the same. Okay. And then we say, you know, for some Z in, you know, F to the N, so an N length vector Z, this rank one constraint system is satisfied. Oops, sorry, is satisfied if the, the matrix vector product AZ element wise producted with BZ equals CZ. Okay, so we're doing so, so this is uh, a matrix vector product, each of these. And then here, this is the element wise product of these two matrix vector products. That's what I mean by this little circle. Okay, great. So, so then we say uh, for an R, for an instance, which is defined by these three matrices A, B, C, uh, and some input output vectors x and y, we say that an instance is satisfiable if there exists a witness such that when we define z as you know x, y, w, one, we get a z Hadamard product b z equals c z. Okay, so it's satisfiable just when there exists a witness that produces a satisfied instance. Okay, and then you know there, it's a it's a pretty simple theorem that uh, R one C S sat is N P complete. Um, okay, how do we prove that? Well, we've just seen. Uh, a mechanical transformation from arithmetic circuits to R1CS. And there's a likewise a mechanical transformation in the other direction. So these two are totally equivalent and arithmetic circuit satisfiability is uh, NP complete. So that, that's enough, that establishes it here. Okay, so why, why do we care about R1CS sat? What's the, why are we going to talk about this? Well, there are kind of two answers. Um, one is that it's a good structure it turns out for the kind of, uh, of of complexity theoretic objects we're going to build, which we'll see right now. So it's a good structure for IOPs. And the other reason that these have become somewhat popular, um, this is a this is a statement of opinion now, is um, I think one reason that people tend to like them is they're actually a pretty good target for compilation. So remember we saw all these front ends that are targeting something, um, it turns out R1CS is a pretty pretty reasonable target for for a compilation. Arithmetic circuits are too, but you can you get additions for free with R1CS, so uh, maybe that's a little nicer somehow. So it's a good compilation target, maybe. Okay, good. So so this is R1CS. We've now defined it, and. So now let's let's talk about how we're going to go from we're, we have some R1CS statement that we want to prove, uh, and we want to do that by um, uh, we want to do that by uh, going from 
uh, snarks. Uh, sorry, so we're, we're going to do that using uh, interactive oracle proofs and um, and polynomial commitments. Okay, so the high level structure is like this. So basically, the idea is we're going to have some complexity theoretic object, which is today going to be our Marlin light IOP. And we're going to have some cryptography, which today is our polynomial commitment scheme. We're going to put those together. And what we get out is a snarg. OK, um, so let's talk a little bit more about this. The, the piece that we haven't yet defined is the complexity theoretic object, the, the IOP. Um, so let's do that now. OK, so uh, an IOP uh, is um, is a sort of a generalization of interactive proofs and probabilistically checkable proofs. Uh, and I'm only going to define it informally. So informally, in each round, there, it's a multi-round interaction between a verifier and a prover. In each round, the prover gives the verifier Oracle access to a message. So what this means is the verifier doesn't actually have to read the prover's entire message. Instead, it can sample pieces of the verifier of the prover's message and read just those. So you can kind of think about this as an, uh, an interactive proof where instead of sending a string to the verifier in each round, the, the prover sends a PCP. And then the verifier just has to check the PCP at a few small points. So um, uh, let's see, uh, this is uh, RRR is Rothblum, Rothblum and Rheingold uh, and BCS is uh, Ben Sasson, Kiesa, and Spooner, uh, and they call them slightly different things. Uh, IOP is from BCS 16. RRR calls them PCIPs, probabilistically checkable interactive proofs. Um, but th these are you know, morally equivalent constructions. Um, OK, and today, in particular, we're going to look at a public coin IOP. So we're going to build a, a public coin IOP. OK, and pausing for a moment, public coin, that means, of course, that the verifier sends random challenges in each, in each round. So the, the verifier, the prover sends a message, the verifier responds with a random challenge. And this continues. OK, so we're going to build a public coin IOP where any cheating prover P star is limited to sending a polynomial of bounded degree. OK, and you know, as a little bit of a spoiler, of course, the, the degree bound that we're supposing, well, that's going to come from the polynomial commitment scheme. OK, OK, great. So um, pictorially, we're going to have the prover sending the verifier a polynomial, the verifier sending back a random challenge, and we're going to repeat that some number of times. Um, and uh, so then uh, the verifier at the end can make some queries to the polynomials and decide whether to accept or to reject. OK, so that's the IOP. And then the idea, as I've just alluded, that, that we're going to use is to compile this from an IOP to a SNARG. Um, the, the prover is going to send polynomial commitments. And then the verifier um, asks the prover to open the polynomials at particular points and checks those proofs. OK, so that's our that's that's the scheme that we're going to use. We're going to first write down a polynomial IOP, and then we're going to use a polynomial commitment scheme to turn that into a proof, into a, an argument, into a, 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 a and eventually we'll make it non-interactive via fiat Shamir. OK, so now before we actually get into constructing the IOP, we're going to need sort of three sub protocols that we're going to need to actually construct Marlin light. Um, so the first polynomial protocol, which I'll call P PP1 um, is an IOP for polynomial equality. Uh, so first, we're going to need a fact. Uh, and that fact is uh, two distinct polynomials of degree at most d agree on at most d points. Uh, and, um, well, OK, we can convince ourselves of this uh, pretty straightforwardly. Um, in the univariate case, why is this true? Well, it's true because uh, we can define, uh, so if we have polynomials q and r, of degree d, then uh, the difference polynomial s 
has degree at most D. Uh, and of course, by the fundamental theorem of algebra, this means it has at most D roots. So then the, the, the difference can only be you know, zero at at most D points. Okay. And for the multivariate case, well, we have the schwartz zippel lemma, uh, which essentially extends this result to the multivariate case. So we either we go via fundamental theorem of algebra for univariate or via schwartz zippel for multivariate. But you know, the argument is roughly the same. OK, so then this implies a protocol that we can just write down uh, directly. Um, so the protocol is the prover is going to send two oracles, a Q oracle and an R oracle. So these are the two polynomials that it claims are equal. Um, uh, and then the verifier is going to select some, some challenge gamma and query Q of gamma and R of gamma. And if these two are equal, then it accepts and otherwise it rejects. Okay, so why is this, why does this work? Well, okay, so completeness is pretty immediate. If Q and R are indeed equal, then their evaluations at any point are equal. Good. How about soundness? Well, um, so if Q and R are different, then the prover is sorry, the verifier would have had to get very unlucky in order to be tricked, right? Because the, the degree of these is D. So, um, so the soundness error here, which is to say, you know, the probability that the verifier is tricked is at most D over the size of the field, right? And so if this is a big field, let's think D is, you know, uh, 10,000 and the field is two to the 256. Well, okay, then that's that, that the probability is extremely low that the verifier would have gotten so unlucky as to choose, you know, a bad point. So if the verifier gets two equal points, great, it's convinced. Okay, so that's protocol number one, nice and straightforward. We're gonna build on that. Okay, protocol number two, a little more complicated. What we're going to want now is we want a protocol to let the prover convince the verifier that some polynomial vanishes at every point in some subgroup H of F. So, so we're going to say H is a multiplicative subgroup of F of size N, uh, and little h is a generator of that group. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we can define. Uh, uh, let's first define the vanishing polynomial. For H. Okay, and that's defined as we're going to call that Z sub H of big X uh, is equal to essentially it's just um, the product of, you know, all the roots um, in H, right? So this is, or, you know, a root at every element of H rather. So, okay, so, so remember that little h generates the group h. So if we go, you know, i equals one to n, uh, this is this is sort of one root at every point in the group h. This is the vanishing polynomial on h. Okay, so now we need a second fact. Uh, any degree less than d polynomial g of x um, vanishes on some set h if and only if there exists a polynomial r of degree. Well, it's D minus size of H, fine. Um, some, some degree close to D, um, such that um, essentially uh, G of X is equal to the, zero, the vanishing polynomial on H times R. So in other words, if a polynomial val vanishes at every point on H, then it, it, it's divisible by the vanishing polynomial on that set, okay? And, and therefore there exists a polynomial such that you know, we can multiply the two and get the original, okay. So this is the fact that we're going to use um, to, to build our, our second protocol. And here's the protocol. Let's write it down. So if there exists an R, the idea is, well, the prover can send it, can, can materialize it, and then the verifier can query it, right? So uh, the prover sends uh, G and R oracles to the verifier. Then the verifier selects another challenge gamma from the field and queries g at gamma and r at gamma. And then it evaluates 
the vanishing polynomial at gamma. Okay, and I should note that evaluating the vanishing polynomial is easy um, because there's a lot of structure to this polynomial. So it turns out that any vanishing polynomial is, is relatively easy to, to, to evaluate. So this is even lightweight work for the, for the verifier. Um, uh, and then finally, um, you know, the verifier accepts just if, uh, just if, uh, you know, this works out. So G of gamma equals R of gamma times ZH of gamma. Okay, so completeness is by this fact above, right? So um, uh, if, you know, if, if uh, G is indeed divisible by the, the vanishing polynomial, then great, then the, the prover can certainly materialize a polynomial R. Um, and soundness comes essentially from the polynomial equality test that we saw before, right? So uh, if these two polynomials are equal, then the, the verifier is convinced that they are, uh, except with tiny, tiny, tiny error. Okay, great. So that's our second uh, mini protocol. The third mini protocol that we need, um, uh, this comes from um, uh, a Ben Sasson et al. paper. Uh, it's a very nice paper. Um, it's called a univariate sum check. Uh, this comes, I believe, from the Aurora paper, which uh, is just from 2019. Um, so now the goal for the univariate sum check is, um, again, for some uh, multiplicative subgroup H of our field, um, and in some polynomial Q, the prover wants to convince the verifier that the sum of all of the evaluations at Q on the subset H is zero. Okay, so, so, so we have some subset H, we're gonna evaluate, essentially we're gonna evaluate Q at every point, and if we sum them all together, then we get zero, okay? And for this, we're gonna need an interesting fact. Um, so this is, uh, we're gonna call this fact number three, uh, and this is uh, due to uh, Biot and Chapman, uh, 1999. This is a nice number theory paper. Um, and that fact says uh, equation one uh, here, uh, this equation holds uh, if and only if uh, there exist polynomials R of degree at most uh, D minus N and S of degree strictly less than N minus one, uh, such that uh, we can factor Q uh, in the following way. Uh, I'm gonna write it down and then we'll talk through it. Okay, so we can we can factor x. Sorry, we can factor q into um, a piece that is divisible by. Uh, sorry, that is is sort of divisible by the vanishing polynomial, right? So that's this first piece here, and then a second piece um, that has no constant term. Okay, so this is our fact, and um, and we can use this to build our univariate sum check. Um, so I. I uh, this this fact is proven in, in Biot and Chapman ninety nine. Uh, I, I think the proof is is um, not totally trivial, <laughs> so we will uh, we will take it as as stated. Okay, but so the idea here is basically Q of X disappears on this subgroup just if we can sort of split it into these two pieces. And of course, if we can do that, then the prover can materialize those two pieces and it can convince us of that fact, right? So we've seen this a couple of times now, but we're gonna kind of put together the two, the two things that we've seen already, this, this sort of uh, vanishing test and the polynomial equality test. And this gives us our protocol, right? So our protocol will be um, the prover sends uh, oracles to Q, R, and S, And then the verifier selects a challenge, gamma, uh, from the field and queries Q at gamma, R at gamma, and S at gamma, and then evaluates the vanishing polynomial also at gamma, which remember, that's easy, that's cheap, uh, and then accepts just if, uh, if you know, the, the equation holds, right? C sub H of gamma uh, times 
r of gamma plus gamma times s of gamma equals um, q of gamma. Okay, so this is our our uh, our protocol for the um, univariate sum check. The completeness comes from fact three, and the soundness comes from the polynomial identity testing. Okay, so now we have these three mini protocols, and now we're ready to build an IOP for rank one constraints. Okay. So before we can continue, any questions? Okay. Maybe just can I make a comment? Yes, please. Yeah. So, um, well, just that I, I um, actually we we had a paper where we, there is an, another way to prove the univariate sum check that's actually you don't need to use like really uh, roots of you like the, actually you can relate it in a simple way to polynomial evaluation. Oh, so, oh, that's very nice. Um, yeah. So I mean, you all you need like for roots of unity is the 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 form of the Lagrangians of the Lagrange polynomial. Okay, that they have this specific uh, concise uh, form, but but yeah. So very what nice. I want to say is that I, what I like about that is that actually it's not such a complex uh, number. Um, like in this form, it's a complex number theory result, but it can also be stated as uh, something that is like uh, textbook uh, polynomial, I think. Well, maybe I show you offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be great. Or uh, yeah, that would be that would be fantastic. Yeah, I, I would love to to see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, okay. So let's uh, let's build Marlin Light. Okay, so uh, this is a, a, a light version of uh, the Marlin uh, uh, paper, and I'll tell you why it's light in a moment. Um, but we're we're sort of we're, we're getting to the essence of it, and then um, and there's some extra steps to to really get all the way to to Marlin. Um, okay, so remember, we're, this is an R1 and an R1CS SAT IOP. Um, so that means uh, we have um, A, B, and C fixed. Uh, and I want to uh, point out we're doing a simplification here. We're just going to assume that it's an n by n, uh, that these are n by n matrices, which means that there are n variables and n constraints. Um, okay. And that just makes all the notation a little easier. Uh, and our goal is to prove that there exists a Z uh, such that, you know, AZ Hadamard product BZ equals CZ. Okay. So we're going to prove that um, there's some satisfying assignment for this for this uh, R1CS instance. And so we're gonna need some ideas. So our first idea uh, is we're going to encode the vectors Z, AZ, BZ, and CZ as polynomials of degree N minus one, okay? Uh, and as before, let's imagine uh, H is a sub is a multiplicative subset of the field. Um, the size of H, uh, you know, is equal to n, uh, and H generates little H generates uh, big H. Okay. Um, okay. So then uh, now we can define a polynomial Z Z hat uh, of X, uh, and this is a unique polynomial with degree less than n, uh, such that uh, z hat of h to the i is the ith entry of the z vector. So for i and one to m, right? Okay. So so just to make sure that the the notation is clear here, I'm going to use brackets to index into the vector z. So the vector z has n entries, um, and the evaluation of the polynomial z hat at little h to the i, so the ith element of the, the group h, is just the ith entry of the vector z. Okay, and since z has n, uh, you know, has n, um, uh, uh, n entries, uh, and we have sort of, we're defining n points, uh, we get a polynomial of degree n minus one. Uh, and likewise, we're going to do the same thing for the other, um, for the other, uh, 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 polynomials. So we, we're going to define uh, z sub a hat uh, of h to the i to be equal to the vector a times z, the ith entry, right? So the, the ith entry of the matrix vector product a z. 
and z sub b hat of h to the i is you know the i entry of b times z and z sub c hat right okay okay so we've encoded encoded these four vectors as four polynomials and you know each of these you know things i've written in parens here is essentially a length and vector right okay so then if the prover sent oracles to these polynomials c hat z sub a hat z sub b hat z sub c hat uh, if it sent oracles to the verifier then the verifier could just check well okay fine a z had a mark product b z uh, equals c z is true just when you know z, z hat sub z z a hat um, of h to the i times z b hat of h to the i equals z c hat of h to the i for all sorry for all i in one to n Okay, so if 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 there's this pointwise equivalent uh, equality for all i in one to n, then that means that this must be this must represent, uh, you know, the this Hadamard product of of um, the equality of you know C Z with the Hadamard product of A Z and B Z. Okay, so uh, how do we check that? Well, we can do exactly what we've done before. A Z B Z equals C Z uh, is true just if um you, you know this polynomial z z a times z b minus z c vanishes on h right because if it vanishes on h then that means that point wise uh each of these equalities that we required up here uh, must hold right if, if if this polynomial vanishes on h then all of these equalities must be true and vice versa Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that we should use polynomial protocol number two. Okay, great. So we're gonna use uh, polynomial protocol number two to check this vanishing. Uh, great. So specifically, let's write it down, right? The prover is gonna send uh, oracles, uh, an R oracle, sorry, uh, such that, you know, R is, it claims that R is equal to, you know, Z A of X times, uh, sorry, Z hat A of X times Z hat B of X minus uh, Z hat C of X, right? So that's the R oracle it's gonna send um, uh, oh, times, uh, sorry, uh, so it's going to send an oracle, oracle such that uh, this uh, 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 polynomial z a times z b minus z c uh, equals r times the vanishing polynomial on h. Okay, so that's our polynomial protocol number two, right? We're going to we're going to check that this uh, the the that this polynomial uh, can be divided by the vanishing polynomial. And then, of course, we're going to follow through in, with the rest of polynomial protocol number two. The verifier is going to pick uh, a challenge gamma, uh, and it'll query the polynomials, and then it'll accept, you know, if the if the condition if the appropriate condition holds, the condition from polynomial protocol number two. Okay, so this convinces the verifier that ZA, ZB, and ZC represent uh, a satisfying assignment uh, times the respective matrices A, B, and C. But what it doesn't do yet is it, it doesn't convince the verifier that, say, Z sub A is actually consistent with the A matrix and the Z vector. Right, so now we have we have a small problem. Right, uh, we don't know that z sub a is consistent with the vector a z. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to do some more polynomial tricks. 
Okay, so here's idea number two. Um, so we're going to encode the, the matrix A, which remember is an n by n matrix, as a bivariate polynomial, right? So, uh, and we're going to have, you know, sorry, we're going to have A hat is this bivariate polynomial such that A hat of h to the i, h to the j, remember h is our generator of the, of the subgroup, uh, is equal to, sorry, is equal to the i j entry of the matrix, okay? And then by sort of by the, you know, by the definition of the matrix vector product, uh, we know that, you know, z sub a hat, um, you know, if it's honestly generated uh, must be equal to, you know, an appropriate sum, I'll just write it down. Um, and then we'll talk through it. Okay, so essentially what we know then is that, you know, this is essentially just the, the computation of, uh, of a matrix vector product, right? On the right here, I'm, I've just sort of written down the matrix vector product between A and Z. Um, and then on the left, we have the polynomial that represents the result of that matrix vector product, right? So, um, so it must be the case that these polynomials are equal if indeed Z sub A hat is honestly generated from A and Z hat. Uh, and likewise for, you know, for uh, Z sub B hat and B and Z sub C hat and C. Sorry, Z sub B hat and B, Z sub C hat and C. Okay, so now how do we check this? Well, we're gonna apply polynomial protocol number one. Um, so to start, uh, the verifier is going to pick a value beta sub a randomly from the field uh, and send it to the verifier and send it to the prover. And then I'm going to write down an equation and then we'll talk through it. Um, so we're going to call this equation three. Uh, so if we have that. Uh, Z sub A hat at beta sub A is equal to the sum of oops. Okay, so if uh, Z sub A evaluated at beta sub A is equal to the sum of the evaluations of, um, you know, Z hat at each of the elements of H times uh, an appropriate evaluation of A hat, which is essentially just, we're reading this off from the definition of a matrix vector product. Then um, this equation here, which we'll call equation two, should have written that before. So then the required equation here will hold, except with some vanishing probability, right? Right, so then equation two uh, holds, except with say probability, you know, some small probability re related to the size of the field and um, the, the degree of these polynomials, right? So this is polynomial protocol number one. Okay. So great. So then how do we check that equation three holds? <laughs> We've reduced pro one problem to a different problem. Okay. So now finally, how do we check this? So to check equation three, um, we're going to define uh, a new polynomial Q sub A. Uh, and I'll, again, I'll write it down and then we'll, we'll talk through it. Uh, this is equal to um, oops. Uh, okay. Um, okay, great. So uh, 
So to check equation three, we're going to define this Q of X, this Q sub A of X, uh, which is equal to uh, sort of the piece that we wanted from before, right? This is A hat uh, evaluated at, uh, you know, in this first argument at beta sub A. Um, so the polynomial that we get from evaluating just the first argument at beta sub A um, times uh, Z hat of X minus this small correction term, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, the result of uh, sort of evaluating Z sub A hat at our point beta and dividing by n, dividing by the, 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 um, the degree. Um, so then now, finally, we have that equation three holds if and only if the sum of Q sub A evaluated H to the I equals zero. In other words, we need to evaluate a univariate sum check on Q sub A. And for that, we use polynomial protocol number three. Okay. So again, so, so the prover sends uh, oracles to R sub A, S sub A. Um, the verifier chooses uh, a gamma sub A in F, uh, and it evaluates A at beta sub A, gamma sub A, um, the vanishing polynomial at gamma sub A, uh, and then it queries, uh, queries a bunch of things, right? It needs to query uh, Z sub A hat, uh, Z hat, R sub A, uh, and S sub A. My apology. Okay, and then it just checks finally uh, that you know all of these queries are consistent. So the final check is I'll, I'll write it down, um, and then we'll talk about it. Um, uh, so this is the evaluation of a hat times the evaluation of z hat uh, minus uh, the evaluation of z sub a hat divided by n. And that needs to be, because of our uh, univariate sum check, that needs to be equal to uh, R of A times Z, the vanishing polynomial minus, uh, sorry, plus gamma times uh, S sub A. Okay, so this check is, I, is just exactly from our univariate sum check, uh, and we're using it here to check that uh, Q sub A Sub sums to zero over uh, the subgroup H. And that is, we need that to be true because we sort of cleverly chosen um, the Q sub A polynomial to vanish in exactly that case. Okay, so then of course we need to repeat that for Z sub B hat and B and Z sub C hat and C, but then we're actually convinced that Z sub A hat, Z sub B hat and Z sub C hat are consistent with Z and the matrices A, B, and C, and that's enough. Now we've got it, that's, that's the whole proof system, okay? So in sum, what did we need? Well, we needed, um, we can put it all together now. We needed uh, the, the prover knows a witness um, for this, this R1CS instance, um, and the verifier knows the matrices and the claimed inputs and outputs, X and Y. Um, and then basically there's two, types of checks that we're doing. One is to check that Z sub A hat, Z sub B hat, and Z sub C hat are, uh, you know, are represent uh, sort of a, a, you know, an accepting instance. So for that, the prover uh, sends, you know, the Z hat, Z sub A hat, Z sub B hat, Z sub C hat oracles, uh, and an R oracle. Uh, and then the verifier runs, um, uh, you know, this is polynomial, polynomial protocol number two uh, to check that ZA, ZB, and ZC are consistent, you know, represent an R1CS instance. And then um, now the verifier is samples uh, these randomizers, beta A, beta B, and beta C, and we're going to check the consistency of Z sub A hat, Z sub B hat, and Z sub C hat with A, B, C, and Z. Uh, and to do that, 
uh, again, we're going to, uh, the, the verifier is going to sample these, these uh, randomizers. The prover is going to send uh, oracles. You remember we had the, this R sub A and S sub A. And then likewise for B and C, R sub B, S sub B, R sub C, S sub C. And then the verifier runs the polynomial protocol number three check for each for each of the pairs. Okay, and that that's it. That completes the IOP. <sighs> Great. So now we've constructed the IOP. And remember, what, the way that we're actually going to convert this now into a SNARG is every time we said the prover sends an oracle, what really happens is the prover sends a polynomial commitment. And every time we said the verifier queries the oracle, what really happens is the verifier tells the prover, please send me the evaluation of the polynomial plus a proof that that evaluation was correct. And then the verifier has to actually execute the check procedure for the polynomial, uh, uh, for the polynomial commitment scheme in each case. OK, so I've left out a bunch of details. Uh, and I will I will uh, try to at least admit to some of them here. Um, so the first detail is um, I've said above that the prover sends the vector z, but really we were trying to to establish that the prover knows a vector w, the witness, uh, and the verifier needs to make sure that z is you know sort of a correct combination of x, y, the witness, and the constant value one. So how do we do that? Well. Uh, right, right. So, so in particular, the verifier supplies these, right? Um, so, in in Marlin um, and, and in you know many other schemes, um, one way to do this is to use polynomial commitment homomorphism tricks. So, if there's a, some sort of additive homomorphism, which many of these polynomial commitment schemes have, then it's sort of easy to uh, sort of uh, to to piece together evaluations from sort of a piece of a, of a polynomial that I know and a piece that's committed. So we can use uh, homomorphism tricks. Okay. Um, a second question we could ask is, is there an appropriate subgroup? I mean, I, I, we've just assumed that a subgroup exists. So how do we make sure that one does? Well, in general, what we do is we just pick you know, we just pick our, our field carefully uh, such that, you know, such that some H of, a pro of approximately the right size exists. And then we pad N to, you know, some size. So as an example, um, and this is what uh, Carla was alluding to earlier. If uh, if we're if we're working in uh, you know a field uh, you know such that you know a prime prime order field uh, such that the order is p, then if p minus one is divisible by some big power of two, like say two to the thirty, then this means that a two to the thirty size subgroup exists uh, and is relatively easy to find. Uh, and so then what we can do is we we can um, simply pad up n to say two to the 30 and we're done. Um, so we can we can sort of engineer our field so that we can be sure that such an H exists. Uh, and the final and maybe the biggest thing that I swept under the rug is that evaluating a hat and b hat and c hat is expensive for the verifier. Um, so how do we handle this? Well, one answer is maybe it's okay. Um, because you know, maybe we're not actually concerned with the verifier's computation in some instance. Maybe instead we're just concerned with making sure that the proof is small. Usually that's not true. Usually we want the verifier to be very fast. But um, but sometimes that's a, sometimes uh, we wouldn't worry about this. Um, another possibility is, and I've mentioned this a couple of times now. Well, maybe it's a structured computation. Um, so if the matrix A has you know, some repeated structure to it, then probably I can play some trick where evaluating this polynomial, I can do it in a much smaller space and then sort of uh, in a much smaller amount of computation uh, and then sort of uh, step and repeat. Um, so structured computations make this somewhat easier. Um, the third trick, and this is what Marlin actually does, is we can outsource the evaluation of uh, the A hat uh, um, polynomial. Essentially, the idea here is we're going to use polynomial commitments again. Um, the verifier this time is going to commit 
to a, a polynomial representation of the A matrix. Why do we want the verifier to do it? We want the verifier to do it so that the verifier knows um, that it was correctly committed to, right? Because the verifier knows the content of A. So the verifier generates a polynomial commitment to you know, some A polynomial, and then the, it tells the prover, please evaluate this polynomial for me and just prove that you've done so correctly. Um, so uh, this is sort of another use of the polynomial commitment scheme. Okay, um, and so we actually see this uh, in a few other systems as well, this, this idea that we can sort of commit to um, a polynomial that represents the computation and then have the prover evaluate that polynomial for us. I think I mentioned Spartan earlier, it does that, but for a slightly different kind of polynomial, um, uh, you know, we see this, uh, this theme repeated um, recently many times. So um, really these polynomial commitment schemes are extremely useful as I, I hope we've now seen. Um, and, uh, you know, with some clever polynomial tricks, we're able to go from a polynomial commitment scheme uh, to uh, a succinct non-interactive argument. Okay, so then finally, the last maybe piece of this is, what do we need to go from uh, a succinct non-interactive argument to uh, an argument of knowledge, right? So um, what that implies is we need to be able to write down an extractor algorithm, right? We need an algorithm that given, uh, say, rewinding access to the prover is able to output the witness that the prover must have used, uh, you know, if the prover can make me accept. Um, so what that generally is going to require is an extractable polynomial commitment scheme. So we can sort of add the, we can sort of push the requirement for extraction down into the polynomial commitment scheme. And then maybe there's a little bit of careful design in the IOP. I'm sweeping a lot of details under the rug, but that's essentially what's going to go on in order to get to an argument of knowledge. And then finally, 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 um, we could ask, well, what if I want a zero knowledge snark? Um, usually the way that that happens is there's some sort of uh, masking that goes on. So basically, instead of sending exactly the polynomial, say, Z sub A, we send Z sub A masked with some randomizer polynomial that the prover has chosen. And then, uh, you know, we can sort of arrange everything so that um, the, the verifier, uh, so that that masking polynomial is, is sort of cancels out in the final, final check, but the prover sort of reveals nothing about the actual polynomial Z sub A, right? So essentially, you know, if I make uh, let's say if I make, you know, K queries to the polynomial, then if the prover sort of masks with an additional K terms, uh, say K coefficients, then I'm not learning anything about the actual coefficients of the polynomial because there are extra degrees of freedom that the polynomial, that the prover can choose. Um, so these are the, this is the general uh, strategy for turning these things into zero knowledge. Um, great. So that brings us to the end of the construction. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think the end of our time as well, um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, to chat, uh, you know, stay afterwards and chat about specific topics uh, as y'all would like. Thank you very much, Riyad, for the very nice uh, presentation. Uh, uh, maybe we can ask if, if there are any questions. I, I would like to ask something, but it's just to be a bit of uh, polemic, not, not too very polemic. <laughs> But um, recently I was watching on, uh, I was reading on Twitter, like uh, uh, Gabby's on uh, with Ben Sasson um, discussion um, where I think it was started by Vitaly Kuterin on the future of, um, of snarks, who, what will be the do dominant? Will it be Starks? Will it be snarks, whatever? And I think, um, I like what Gabison replied that he was saying that he thinks that the mm, pre-processing model, no, which to, in your talk, the pre-processing model corresponds to this case where this B variate uh, polynomial is somehow outsourced to the computation. So um, just for the audience that the pre-processing model is where, where somebody pre-processes the CR SRS so that the verifier can be more efficient. He was saying he thinks this is the future. And my question to you is, do you also think this is the future? And like, it always seems like a good idea to pre-process the, the, the circuit, right? Like, even if this computation is structured, why not pre-process the, the circuit and gain something from this? Yeah, I totally agree. You know, anytime that it's possible to pre-process, and so we have to think about when does it make any sense to pre-process, right? Because I'm kind of pushing costs around a little bit. Um, so, uh, somebody that the verifier trusts or maybe the verifier themselves has to be the one that does this pre-processing step, right? Um, so 
you know, and maybe the pre-processing step is, I mean, certainly it's at least as expensive as evaluating the computation, right? So if I'm only going to run the computation once, uh, maybe I don't gain anything from pre-processing. But I think in most cases, and I'm sure that this is what Ariel was talking about, you know, in most of the cases that we care about, you know, we fix a computation. So concretely, the example would be, say, Zcash. There's one computation. They do it over and over and over again. Uh, so we pay once for the pre-processing, but then we get to amortize that cost, right? So yeah, absolutely. Anytime that we have, you know, an amortization regime, of course, we would prefer a pre-processing. Um, but sometimes there aren't, uh, you know, these opportunities to amortize. And I think for that, you know, the, the, the kind of the backup uh, is a structured computation, uh, right? So if the computation is structured, then even if I don't pre-process, I still have a hope of saving. Uh, and of course, look, if the computation is structured and I can pre-process even better, right? That makes the pre-processing cheaper. And, uh, you know, maybe I, I can get away with sort of the getting, getting a little bit of help from each one. So, um, but yeah, I think in the general case, anytime you can pre-process, uh, most likely it makes sense to. Um, and uh, as a backup, we hope for some structure. And if we get neither of those, then unfortunately the verifier doesn't save very much work. But I should point out, like, even if the verifier doesn't save work concretely or even asymptotically, um, that's okay if zero knowledge is giving us something we couldn't do otherwise, right? So for any kind of zero knowledge proof where we say, well, look, the verifier can't save any work, but if we didn't have a zero knowledge proof system, then the verifier just couldn't get any, any, anything done anyway, then, well, we're willing to pay that. So, um, so it seems like there are kind of, there are a few ways that we can go here. We can either say, well, we care about zero knowledge, so maybe the verifier is allowed to be expensive, or we could say we have pre-processing, so we can amortize, or we have, uh, you know, some kind of structure, so we can take advantage of that. And I, I think any of these roads or any combination of these roads uh, sort of makes sense in some cases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? All right. Uh, if not, let's thank again uh, Riyadh for the very nice presentation. Thank you very much. I'm sure some people disappeared because it's late, but we, they will watch the video. I can, um, I'm sure quite some people that will be watching this. Yeah, no, it was very, very interesting. I learned and, a lot. Uh, yeah, we have to thank uh, again uh, Riyadh and also uh, our, well, the, the three lecturers today, uh, they gave very nice presentations. So thanks again to for the very hard work and uh, welcome everybody to come tomorrow uh, for the second day of uh, the Advanced School of Cryptography. We are gonna have uh, another three amazing presentations and uh, a surprise that Valerie uh, promise by the end of the day so uh, so uh, we we want to see you tomorrow and with that sounds we cool finish <laughs> <laughs> yeah sounds good um, so uh, that's the end of today and uh, we'll see you tomorrow bye see ya. thanks thanks bye. Riyadh. thank you Riyadh. thank you see you tomorrow thank you thank you. See you thank you very much